Now, let's get ready for our next panel. Captain A.J. Berlotti has assembled a fantastic panel of ALPA subject matter experts to talk about September 11th, which we remembered on Monday and the impact that that day has had on our industry. I'd now like to ask Captain Berlotti and his panelists to make their way to the stage. Good morning, everyone. I want to thank everybody in this room for joining us uh, this morning. Uh, it's, um, I've been looking forward to doing this panel uh, for a long time. We've assembled uh, four fine gentlemen up here that are at the uh, top of their professions as far as uh, helping out the pilots here uh, with the jump seat and security issues. All of us have been doing this for a long, long time, and we'll have a lot to, uh, to offer everyone today. Uh, as everyone has noticed, uh, there, the central theme uh, this week has been the events of 9-11. And we all have a story. Uh, the four of us, the five of us on this stage, everybody in the room. Uh, I know that there's probably a few that were kids when 9-11 happened. Uh, there's one in our group that actually wasn't even born yet. So you want to talk about something that makes you feel old real quick. Um, and we each have a story of where we were on that day. Um, I was uh, actually sitting on a jump seat on American Airlines trying to commute to work. Uh, ironically, it was to start a job uh, on September 17th. Needless to say, my class was canceled. Fortunately, I had a, a good job and, and uh, I lucked out and, and I fared better than, than some uh, after those uh, events. Uh, as I said, there's one thing that we've all tried to do is um, educate and train and have the, the, the younger generation, the new pilots that are coming up behind us, uh, what it means to be a professional airline pilot, um, what it means to have proper etiquette and training with jump seat and the security procedures and policies that are in place now uh, that were not in place uh, before 9-11. You know, if you think about it, the, the world that we live in, we've all become accustomed to it uh, since those events. Uh, you know, just the process of going to work is, is you know, sometimes it can be a huge hassle. Uh, we now have to deal with uh, the TSA. Um, taking off your shoes, your uh, computer has to go in. You can't take 3.5 ounces. 3.4 is okay, 3.5 is bad. Uh, for us in jump seat, uh, you know, we have to deal with um, uh, things like uh, CAS uh, being verified that way. And it, it took us five years of hard work after those uh, events at 9-11 to actually just be able to ride in the flight deck uh, offline. I want to go ahead and uh, introduce my panel to my left here. I have Captain James Burrs on. He's a Czech airman on the A320 for United Airlines, and he's the... Uh, Vice Chair of, uh, of my group, the ASO Jump Seat Committee. James? Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our conference. I want to, first off, uh, saying I've been doing jump seat work for 15 years now, part of the ASO. Over that time, uh, I definitely have learned from some of the best and hopefully continue that. On 9-11, I was a brand new first officer for a regional, and I was airborne at the time. Um, but there's lots of people here with lots of stories on that. So thanks, AJ, for having me on this panel today. Absolutely. Next to him uh, is Captain Wolfgang Koch. He's a Delta, newly minted uh, uh, A350 captain now, correct? I am. Thank you. And uh, also, he's our ASO security chairman. Thanks. Yep. Yes, so uh, I've been the security chairman since 2016 with the Airline Pilots Association at the uh, national level and have been doing the security work on behalf of the pilots since 2002, shortly after 9-11. And I started with Northwest Airlines back in 1995. Very good. Uh, next to him is uh, Darren Dorn. He's a fellow Alaska Airlines pilot, 7-3 captain, based up in uh, Anchorage. He is our security chairman, and he's also uh, Wolfgang's right-hand man. He's the uh, national uh, security vice chair. 
Darren. Yeah, good morning, welcome. Thanks for uh, showing up today. 9-11, uh, Pirate at Alaska Airlines. Uh, everybody knows sitting in front of that TV, wherever you were. I went back on active duty for three years almost immediately. Uh, did some time overseas, came back. Uh, the FFDO program was in uh, its infancy at that time. I immediately applied for, selected, and attended the FFDO training, and then been involved in aviation security at the MEC level for three or four years, and then been doing national work for over a decade. Thanks, Aaron. Next to him, Captain Paul Emery, uh, newly minted 737 captain at uh, United Airlines. He just uh, rejoined our committee as the uh, director of the Education and Training Committee. Uh, Paul? Good morning. Thank you for attending. Um, I've also been doing uh, jump seat work for almost 15 years, and it's now um, hap very happy to join the uh, ASO leadership team and uh, educate pilots, and that is uh, something I look forward to. Thanks, Paul. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we all have a story of where we were on that day. Uh, one story that uh, really kind of brings home uh, everything that happened. Uh, Captain Emery, uh, would you like to discuss where you were that morning? Sure. I, so I was a uh, regional airline pilot. I was based out of New York, New Jersey, flying uh, the Embraer 145. I'd been married to my wife for just less than two months. Uh, she went away on business to D.C. And I was home. I grew up in the Midwest in a very small town. Never dreamt I'd live in the uh, New York City, the Big Apple. And I was home that morning, preparing to go to work that afternoon. I got up like I usually do for work, got my cup of coffee, turned on the news, was uh, preparing and looking at the weather and thinking, what a wonderful day to go out. Um, I will never forget I was, uh, the route I was going to do. I was going to go up to Providence and then back to Newark and out to Pittsburgh. And as I was getting ready, of course, the, the first airplane struck the first tower. And in your mind, you, you just can't fathom what was going to happen. In your mind, you're like, it's an accident. It's a terrible accident. You couldn't even imagine that somebody would do it on purpose. So as the morning progressed, there were some concerns about what was going to happen. And then it became clearly apparent it was not an accident. Uh, I lived on the Lower East Side, clearly could see the smoke. Um, to this day, I, the, the, the smell and the views are imprinted on my brain. It's been 22 years, and I will never forget. Um, and that's where I was on 9-11. Thanks, Paul. The, um, the, the threats that we faced on September 10th are far different than the threats that we face today. I just want to get uh, the, the, the panel here to interject that what do what do y'all feel is the, the biggest threat that uh, our industry faces today? We'll start with James. Um, as overseeing jump seat and security, um, flight deck access is always a concern. And we are talking 22 years after 9-11. So once 9-11 happened, I mean, most of us weren't able to sit in each other's jump seats for five years. Um, and now we're seeing the trend of people not checking certificates, medicals. Um, cast verification and we've talked about this the last two days with all the jump seat committees around the industry over having 100 people at our conference and overall we're concerned that pilots are relaxing on not betting on who's on the jump seat or on the flight deck period and uh, that, so in my mind that's what keeps me up is making sure we don't have somebody on the flight deck that doesn't belong and doing our jobs that's required by multiple things number one our FOM number two by the security directives of 2002 and we need to make sure that our pilots have number one user PIC authority to make sure they're letting people on the flight deck that's allowed to be on the flight deck and follow those procedures. Thanks James. Wolfgang, what uh, concerns you with security? Well, I am very concerned of the unruly passenger and the behavior of uh, passengers on board the aircraft which unruly passenger is really a good name for criminal behavior and uh, the criminal side of that is just inches from a breaching of the flight deck. And that is still my primary uh, concern. And I'm very happy to see that uh, this, this administration is uh, permitted the installation of secondary barriers on aircraft. Uh, we need to continue to impress upon the industry and the, the traveling public where the need is for that. 
but just yesterday, or excuse me, two days ago, 9-11, on the uh, anniversary date, we had an attempted uh, rush of the flight deck door on the ground in Sacramento, I believe it was, and there was one prior to that as well. So we, we need to pay attention how we better secure the cabins of our aircraft on behalf of unruly passengers, unruly behavior, and what ultimately, you know, it's going to be any type of attack on the flight deck and a loss of those passengers and the security of our aviation system is gonna set us back. And so I'm trying to promote you know, the, the awareness to all our membership and, and, and to the passengers about this. Okay. Darren, what keeps you up at night? The short term, I think Wolfgang hit it right on the head. We immediately have to get control of this disruptive, unruly passenger. Um, and that's easy to do. If the industry itself, management, and the government would just quit playing tiddlywinks and let's hold these people accountable, guess what? It comes to an end. But what really keeps me up is the lack of ability of the organizations in charge of providing security domestically is the chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear threat, CBRNE. Um, it doesn't take much. We can easily defeat that 3.4 ounces and get those uh, items on board an airplane. We know that individuals that wish to do us harm have no problem giving their life for that cause. So it doesn't bother them at all to bring that airplane down and they can easily do that in that CBRNE realm. And we've got to get a, that technology involved immediately to start to detect that because it doesn't take much, whether it's car fentanyl or a chem bio sort. So that keeps me up. Aviation, never forget, is the crown jewel for terrorists. It sends the biggest message and instills fear in the public. Yep. Thanks, Darren. Paul? So while the industry is growing and we've recovered very quickly from COVID, that is all wonderful news. However, we have an influx of new people, and that is refreshing. However, I, the complacency in, in the education portion is where I really think it's important to bring it all back in so that all these new members with various backgrounds, um, we have uh, military, we have corporate pilots, and to make sure they have the building block and the tools to understand how we got to 9-11 and how we never prevent it again. Thanks. Uh, this first question, I'm gonna start with uh, James here to my left. Uh, much of what we do is focused on uh, PIC authority and maintaining the ability for pilots to have unfettered access to the flight deck. Uh, from a security perspective, uh, how are jump, seater, jump seaters able to assist with in-flight security? Well, number one is, and we see this day in and day out, is we, and we all get used to it. Number one, pilots are jump seating in record amount in a month, right? We're seeing 250,000 requests a month for flight deck access. Most of those end up in the back, uh, not always in the front. But when you're in the back of the airplane, you're the same as it is you're on the flight deck as a crew member. And we gotta make sure, number one, the captain knows who's on his airplane. For if there is an incident in the back, the captain has the knowledge of who he has in the back. And number one, as a captain, the first person I'm gonna trust to give me accurate information is another fellow pilot. And if I knew that, the situations have turned out night and day. When we know there's pilots on, in the back of the airplane, we see less diversions or less information that's not accurate going to the flight deck than we do when we don't know that there's a crew member in the back. So by having the crew member on the back of the airplane, number one, they can assist, right? We, we, unfortunately, everybody up on this panel have seen so much video of passengers not behaving. And then during that process, the biggest guys on the airplanes have been the people shooting the video. We watch an, a former NFL player um, shoot the video on his iPhone when a flight attendant was getting beat up pretty bad and he was just videotaping it. So most pilots will always get involved, but we won't know if they're in the back if, if they don't check in with the captain. Yeah, I know some of, the, uh, uh, some of the companies even have policies where if a jump seating pilot is given a cabin seat, they're even instructed not to go uh, up front and check in with the cabin. I know it's for distraction or whatever, but you know, one thing that we all try to do is, is, is teach every pilot as part of our etiquette and training that even if you are given a seat in the cabin that you do need to check in with the, cap uh, with the captain. Uh, this, one, this next one's for Darren. 
Um, the FFDO program uh, it was developed, of course, because of the 9-11 attacks. Can you give us a look at how effective uh, the program has been <laughs> with protecting the flight deck? Well, the program has been effective. I would say absolutely it has. A um, little history lesson, 2002 was the Arming Pilots Against Terrorism Act. That was the actual law uh, signed into effect to allow armed pilot program. Met with some resistance from several organizations, but the law was passed. 2003, April, was the first graduating class, 44 FFDOs. We just had our 20th anniversary this April. I know of at least two individuals in the audience that were in the initial FFDO class over 20 years ago, and that says something out of that original 44. So, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, since that time, we've trained over 20,000 FFDOs. Um, they fly over a million missions a year, both passenger and cargo. So think about that, a million flights a year, domestic and international, are covered by that program. 21 million mission plus since inception, and the average cost per mission is less than $21. That's what it costs the U.S. government. I think the first year it came out was $25 million budget. That budget has never increased since then. Um, even a 3% increase would have brought it to $40 million, but it hasn't. Um, so I think the General Accounting Office called that program the most cost-effective security measure in aviation. That, that says it all. Um, it's got a ways to go. It can continually be improved, just like every single one of our systems can be improved in regards to safety and security, and hopefully, with your support, ALPA support, legislative support, we can move the ball forward, finally. So to, to follow up on that, what do you think are good ways to improve the program more specifically? Uh, is there, uh, what do you feel are the good ways to improve the program with uh, related to flight deck jump seats? So I'm gonna break that in two parts, AJ. Okay. Um, reference jump seaters, I'm gonna look back at you and say, I know you were involved as a jump seater on an American Airlines flight commuting either to or from Dallas. And it's uh, going to work. Yeah. So uh, enhancing the jump seating FFDOs, the ability, whether it's in the flight deck or in back and so forth, some SOP changes, maybe some legislative changes, would greatly enhance uh, the safety and security of the aircraft. In regards to the program overall, um, other than a, a quick amendment in the 2018 FAA reauthorization bill, which granted military-style leave, uh, directed the Air Marshal Service that everywhere federal air marshals go, FFDOs will go. Other than those two improvements, there really hasn't been any in the program in 20 years. Okay. Now, what we need is an FFDO Improvement Act. We've been pushing on it the last couple of years on the legislative front, and uh, we've got several draft papers that all carriers have agreed upon, all FFDOs have agreed upon what we can do to make that better. So if we could get that push on the legislative side, um, very simple things, enhanced training, enhanced training facilities, um, enhanced liability protections if an FFDO does take action. Um, some APATA changes, the original bill uh, has been interpreted incorrectly according to some attorneys okay. at TSA and get some corrective language, but nothing happens with the program without legislative process. Um, and so that's what we're looking for. And are you all seeing any traction with that at all? Um, yeah, we think we get some traction, uh, but you know, our, our big opportunities are the FAA reauthorization bill and the TSA you know, okay. bill. So those are the two big areas because that's what it deals with, Homeland Security and TSA. Thanks, Darren. Yep. Uh, Wolfgang, this one's for you. Uh, many of the security policies uh, that we have have been based on uh, being reactive uh, versus proactive. Uh, the, the work that both you and Darren have done, you know, on behalf of all Al, uh, ALPA pilots uh, has been uh, trying to reverse that, making things more proactive uh, versus reactive. Uh, what are some of the things that the security committee is working on now to protect the flight deck? Well, thanks for that question. Um, you know, really, <clears throat> our part is in-flight security, right? We, as a labor union and crew members, we really are the first responders to an event. Um, the TSA has been built to structure layer after layer after layer of security on the ground to prevent 
a terrorist type of attack on board our aircraft. However, you know, we're at a time in society where people are acting erratically. They are behaving just uh, out of control. And part of this process is that, you know, we are the protecting force on board that aircraft. And so I have uh, recently asked as a member of the Aviation Security Advisory Committee to uh, ask that that committee structure who sits underneath the TSA and is uh, seated by industry leaders and security, that we form a subcommittee working group on in-flight security. And to that nature, it's really taking you know, a look, a harder look and a continuous look at the disruptive nature of, pilot, of, of passengers and how we, with the systems we have on board, to better defend that aircraft from the next hostile attack. And especially, you know, for passengers getting closer and closer to the flight deck door. And so there, there's a lot of discussion that has to be uh, taken into account when we start bringing in the secondary barriers. You know, uh, legislative change with the FFDO SOP procedures. These are just numerous examples that we want to try to get ahead of before that next attack so we can stave that attack off. Okay. I'm going to, because we're talking about uh, uh, passenger disturbances here, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to use this question for the whole panel so uh, everybody have a chance to jump in. Um, you know, since COVID, uh, a lot of people are blaming, you know, the COVID lockdowns, everybody's traveling, we've all kind of lost our collective minds. Uh, the number of in-flight disturbances has obviously increased. Um, how, do, how do we better prepare our crews uh, to deal with, with this? Uh, more to the point, uh, as you mentioned, you know, with the video I was lucky enough to be in, <laughs> um, you know, I, how do we see jump seaters being called in more and more to uh, assist? Do we, do we see it getting better, or is this just kind of the world we live in now? James, I'll, I'll start with you. So, AJ, and you, uh, most people don't know AJ's story. AJ was uh, jump seating on American Airlines, and they had a passenger go out of control in that scenario. But the only reason the crew went to AJ is you weren't in uniform. Yep. So they only knew because he checked in with the crew. He told the crew that they had additional jump seater on the airplane. Otherwise, the pilots probably wouldn't have known you were back there. The flight attendants would have thought you are just a regular passenger, right? Mm -hmm. So that airplane continued to its destination only because the captain knew that he had a fellow pilot in the back that could make sure the passenger was controlled and they didn't divert. Um, so right now, we talk about every day, as a jump seater, for, for us, the best thing is to tell the captain you're on board. And I'm looking at it, I'm flying four legs a day in my airplane now, flying regional flying at my airline. And you're doing 30 to 45 minute turns and the last thing a lot of guys want to deal with is jump seaters. But if you have three or four jump seaters, you definitely want to know they're on board and who they are. Um, so for, uh, from our standpoint, for in-flight or any other issues, make sure the captain knows you're on board. Thanks. Wolf? So the uh, FAA Reauthorization Act is starting to address this, and unfortunately, I, again, it's come down to where it's only legislatively that we're going to possibly get this, but a mandate to train crew members and crew member self-defense. The program's been around since Vision 100, and I believe started in 2005, roughly. And it was in recognition that uh, crew members should be offered the ability to defend themselves in hostile situations. And the promotion of this um, really lingered because it was on your own time, and you had to make the time uh, to attend these courses that were in select cities, uh, at the, usually at the Federal Air Marshal facilities, or then actually at, when it started, it was at some of the uh, junior community colleges. But today, uh, we have that, that may be uh, a component of the FAA Reauthorization Act, which is great. However, this is what I'm trying to do with the ASAC level on the in-flight security uh, working group. And, and the, the fact is, why do we need to keep changing laws to get better security in flight. 
and have to mandate changes like the FFDOSOP? Why can't we work collaboratively within the uh, structure of the, the security group under the TSA to better guide TSA's decision? And not only that, but most importantly, is to make this public. Um, a lot of the industry, aircraft operators, they don't want to talk about this stuff. They don't want the traveling public to know that there still is an issue out there. And how do we address it? Of course, some of how we address it would be maybe SSI as we all know it. Right. But the premise is we should be proactively looking at how to better defend, how to give us better tools on board that aircraft to defend against the unruliness. Yeah, and there's no question that the, uh, the frequency is, in is increasing. I mean, everybody's got a phone now, so, uh, you know, it's, it's 15 seconds from event to uh, being posted on YouTube. Darren, what do you yeah. think? Training and standards. Yeah. Um, talking on crew member self-defense, I'll follow a little bit off Wolfgang. Nine airlines in the last seven years have signed agreements to train new hire flight attendants. That's a great first step. Um, the program has been so successful that they've now started to offer it to customer service agents. And so as I come into that uh, training aspect, that's one. But yet again, almost all of us in here see the massive turnover post-COVID and the ability to get people to work. So we've got 25% new customer service agents, 25% new baggage handlers, 25% new pilot. I mean, it's the whole society is facing this massive turnover and the young population. Well, we need to ensure that when we bring those folks on board and our current folks, that we train them to a standard. Um, the problems start on the ground. They don't start in the air. So the majority of those, I think roughly 1,500 in-flight security incidents so far this year, well above average pre-COVID where we are right now, uh, most of them are mental health issues and under the influence. Well, we should be able to identify those before they get on board the airplane. But the customer service agents being pressured by the company and the supervisor to get people on board, close the door, 10 plus, all that. And we are not identifying the threat. So training, behavioral detection, crew member self-defense, you and using all those 20 layers of TSA security to get that. On the standard side, I'm going to say let's start enforcing the rules that we have. Sure. You know, if a company has a no-fly list, why are we not sharing that list with Somebody else, my fly for Alaska, we get a lot of slope workers coming off dead horse, coming down to Anchorage before they commute home. Hey, we're about the only game in town other than a couple charter companies, right? So if we have a problem on Alaska Airlines because a guy had four beverages in an hour and 40 minutes, do you think he's not gonna be a problem when he gets on board Delta United American, you know, in Anchorage or Seattle? Absolutely. So mm -hmm. uh, once we have the people, we need to identify them and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm all about second chances and rehabilitation. Uh, and we give them that opportunity. But at some point, you've got to hold people accountable. If they physically assault a flight attendant, I know we've changed our policy at Alaska. We will now give the employee the time off. And the corporate attorney and corporate security will now assist that crew member in the prosecution of charges. That's where we need to go, folks. Yep. We need to hold people accountable. Paul, yeah. or, uh, uh, have, you seen, have you seen an increase in uh, passenger disturbances? Uh, definitely, AJ. Uh, I commute from Florida to the Northeast and flights are full. People are stressed. Um, there's no more empty seats between you. There's no more space. And it's just the, the system itself is being strained to the, to the maximum. Yeah. And so we, we see it, I see it on my commutes all the time. Uh, so I'm going to stick with Paul here for a second. As you know, we were talking about uh, the the education and training. So uh, Paul now is our director of education and training. He's been working with uh, the TPC and Stacy and everybody, and they've developed a great uh, program for this. Um, it, it really, it's it's uh, the next generation of pilots. Uh, you know, sees 9/11 as just a point in history. They didn't live it. It was a chapter in a history book. Uh, and so they, they don't understand, uh, or may not fully understand, uh, why it is that we have the system in place today. Um, can, can you let us know uh, how the fast and jet courses can arm, uh, not just you know, every pilot out there, but specifically for jump seaters to deal with, um, with, with the, the changing environment? So we have a lot of new volunteers, and, and part of uh, being a new volunteer is you don't have the information and the tools. 
So we start with the FAST program. We teach them a little bit about the history of ALPA, the structure of ALPA, where your role is within ALPA, how to affect change, what the four pillars uh, of the air safety organization is. Um, that is day one. So we get a good foundation, you know, as pilots, we didn't just you know, automatically jump in an airplane. We had to have building blocks. And so this is our building blocks. We also, uh, I personally teach JET, and this is where we come in. We teach our new, again, our new volunteers of how to, how to structure and, and manage their pilot groups so that they have an understanding of what their roles and responsibilities are, that they're not just somebody sitting either in the flight deck or in the back of the airplane. You are a crew member. You are there to assist if asked. And so I, I think it's going to be a great program going forward. Great. Thanks, Paul. Uh, I'm going to open this up to, uh, uh, to James, uh, Wolfgang, and Darren um, from a cargo perspective. Um, how are we doing uh, getting to the point where we're properly defending the flight deck? Uh, what are the key changes uh, in, your, in your opinions that uh, we need to change uh, here in the near, ter near term and then, of course, going forward? James? Uh, we, we still see on cargo flights every day that we have people on the flight deck that would never be allowed to be on my flight deck as passenger airliner. And that's one of the issues we see is how easy it is to authorize somebody onto a flight deck of a cargo airplane compared to a U.S. passenger flight. That's all, we're, we've been working on this for years, and this, this whole group plus the cargo committee. That's a major concern because, unfortunately, that airplane most of the time is always bigger than my airplane. But they have four nationers that can't are seen on international jump seats of an MD11 or triple seven now on a on a FedEx that are flying around the world that would never be allowed on any of the 121 or 135 carriers that fly U.S. passengers, and that needs to be secured. The, those pilots should not have to have a more risk than I do. Well. So yeah, I, I will repeat what we heard this morning, and this is gonna be a common theme throughout my <laughs> tenure, and I believe everyone's here until we get it solved. But there must be the installation of a primary uh, hardened cockpit door between the cabin of the freighters and the cockpit. There's got to be that division and the installation of those barriers. It's, I, I don't understand how uh, the, the federal government is giving an alternate means of compliance to cargo carriers to have passengers on board their aircraft, yet no division between the passenger cabin and the flight deck of these aircraft. And when we're talking the, the size of aircraft and where they're coming from, you know, I'm sorry, but the, the world is open to them. Right. And the, the, I, I would not want to be in those shoes. Well, I'm going to fall back on uh, Alpa's motto, right? One level of safety. Why is there a cargo carve out? Why did the trade associations remove cargo pilots from the FFDO program's initial language? And we had to have a separate bill to get cargo pilots. Why were IRCDs, you know, intrusion resistant cockpit doors, pulled out of the bill for passenger aircraft? Why are airlines removing secondary barriers that were installed? prior to the legislative requirement for weight savings. Yeah, and we're all, we're all cargo pilots. Whether Absolutely. It's boxes or, or Every single cargo, person in the room that flies is a cargo pilot. Yeah. Yep. So um, it's just, we got to get back to one level of safety. Uh, we've got a cargo security panel tomorrow. I'll be on and we can talk a lot of the specifics, but roughly 80% of the cargo fleet is wide body. Roughly 22% of the passenger fleet is wide body. What airplanes were used on 9-11? what's carrying hundreds of thousands of pounds of fuel and cargo. Right. So we have got to get ALPA, our legislative team on board, which they are with the introduction of the Cargo Safety Act, but we've got to get our legislators on board. You've got to complete the call to actions that are out there. If it's an ALPA member, you've got to follow up with those, and you've got to be vocal. This is your industry. This is your life. What can you do? to ensure your personal security and safety. This is one of those things. Yep, yep great answers. Uh, Paul, I, I mean, during the COVID shutdown, you were 
you know, flying cargo for United, triple uh, sevens across. I mean, wh what are your thoughts on that? What did wh what did you see? Uh, anything in particular while you were doing that without passengers? I, I having flown passenger wide body airplanes prior to COVID, never really. I knew the threats were real, and I knew we had talked about it a lot. However, it became real once I started flying this. The, the access to the airplane, um, the places people can hide, and the things that can surprise us when we are not prepared. I think the theme is we need to be proactive instead of reactive. And as everybody on this panel has said, we need to speak with one voice. It doesn't matter what we fly. The airplanes on 9-11 didn't discriminate on what kind of airplane it was. The, an airplane is, as Darren said, it's, it's very newsworthy when we have an incident or an accident. So if one pilot has a problem, all pilots have a problem. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Um, you know, th this question I had you know, originally designed for James, but it, it really is a, a good question for everybody on this panel. Uh, so I'll start with you and then we'll work our way through. Um, how do we better instill in our management teams that jump seaters are a valuable in-flight security tool? Uh, it seems like you know, jump seaters, like you mentioned, are kind of a nuisance uh, to the agents and sometimes to even the in-flight crew and the pilots. H how can we better instill that we are a valuable security tool and a safety tool as well uh, to the teams that we have to work with every day? Well, so we work with a lot of different managements. I'm very fortunate that my flight ops team is amazing at United and they do a great job of what they help us. Uh, I, I talk to them any time I, a day and night when we have an issue and they're amazing. And, and what we need to do is make sure, number one, is some managements, we have to convince them that the jump seater doesn't cost them money and actually saves them money by having additional crew members on board. We've seen not having an airplane divert. We've seen major, aircraft malfunctions um, where the plane, I'll use Hudson. Most pilots don't realize that there wasn't a jump seater on the flight deck, but there was two jump seaters on that airplane when it landed in the water. And that's why the captain was able to do what he had because he had American Airlines uh, Airbus captain in first class and a Colgan uh, pilot over the uh, Mercy exits in the wing. And those two pilots pretty much did almost 70% of the evacuation process. Um, for that crew because they lost one of their flight tents in the back that got hurt really bad. So we have seen multiple times over my 15 years where a jump seater has, number one, help in emergencies, stop security incidents, and save the airlines from not diverting their flights because of the jump seaters. And, and going back to what our president said this morning, we are getting fuller and fuller and the gay Asians are working flights by themselves. So. That's where our big campaign of make the walk. We don't want to leave one of our own behind because you never know when you're going to need that pilot for any situation on the flight deck. So we have a big campaign coming out this week, make the walk again. It's been around for the last 15 years and it, it gets hard because we're busy, but we got to make sure we get our pilots on the airplane. Very good. Wolfgang? Yeah, so I think it, it comes down to where I think a definition on behalf of, look, the, the, the pilot in command in the document, the common strategy, is known as the in-flight security coordinator. And in that document, there's really no reference of jump seat and, and jump seater or additional crew. So I think it's just a matter of how do we you know, propose a better solution for the security apparatus on board the aircraft through the given documents that we have today and that are required for crew members to know. So having maybe that added layer of security to bring into discussion for in-flight security purposes comes through uh, the education and of course then you know discussing that with management on behalf of hey now we have the common strategy dictating that a a, a flight deck uh, jump seater is really part of the security solution and would be part of a security briefing or however you want to manage the situation on board the aircraft but it goes to that definition, I think, and, and trying to instill some documentation into SOP work and getting to management that way. Thanks. Darren? Again, I'm a training junkie. Um, I'd say it comes down to 
you know, educating the company and management. I understand the liability aspect. I absolutely do. When you go hands-on with somebody, somebody's going to get hurt. And uh, I understand the liability issue, but hey, the FARs are pretty clear for our jump seaters. You know, I'm a crew member. Yeah, I'm qualified and I'm trained. So pushing that aspect up, and then again, it's up to each of us individually. I've got a very set briefing I give the customer service agents, and I've got a set briefing that I give a, a flight attendant when I'm on board. Hey, good morning, I'm Darren. I'm a captain with Alaska Airlines. If there's anything I can do to assist in any way possible, please come back and get me. I'd love to help you. And of course, it's always like, do you push the beverage cart? And I'm like, if you need me to, I will. <laughs> you know. So, But again, letting that crew know. It's 100% I absolutely always check in with the captain. Let me know if there's anything that I can do. We've got a new generation of pilots, and um, they need some good mentorship, and I think that'll carry us a long way in the future if we get a good grasp on our mentorship program for our, our new crew members. Great. Paul? To hit on what Darren said is we do have a lot of new people, but also we talk about educating them, but we also educating and getting the word out to our captains that the jump seater is a resource. Um, you can be a resource to assist with many things, and safety and security is a, a large function of your job. And let that captain know, don't be afraid to call on them. Um, we are part of the crew as a jump seater. So it's, it's the broad spectrum of making sure everybody has the knowledge and the tools um, to keep this industry safe and growing. Thanks. Uh, you know, statistics-wise, uh, greater than 75% of the uh, industry either has or currently does commute, uh, or at least uses the jump seat in some fashion to travel. Uh, if you haven't been involved in an incident, chances are pretty high that you probably will. So uh, always kind of keep that in the back of your minds whenever you're uh, jump seating. Uh, I know we're a little close on time, but uh, we'll try to, s do we have time for a few questions? We don't, I know we're running up on the <laughs> okay. That's Ooh, all right. We're off the hook, AJ. <laughs> I know, that's all right. Uh, thank you everyone for uh, coming out and listening to us today. We really appreciate it, thank you.